everyone thinks she's dead. She just needs to be there by the end of the night. We don't do it again. This is it. This is it. This is the end of the movie. For God's sake. Still in the same frock. Still in the same frock. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'd like you to just do a little bit of a thing. Oh, <laughs> that made me laugh, sorry. <laughs> hey, you watch it, mister. Bobby, man, it's the last day. Don't do this to no. me. I know, I know. I love you, Bobs. I love you more than anything, OK? In the whole world, don't forget. And her sad little song on your sad little piano. You sad little man. He's had a quick go. Yes. <laughs> Whoa, we got to my face, got to my face! We're going to break into the Baroness's house and take the necklace. <laughs> hey, Craig, I think you're in the shot. Craig, Craig, you're in the shot. Craig, you're in the shot. And three, two. <laughs> Stop having fun, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this locked up. Can someone from wardrobe come open this? Hey. I'm not tired. He's tired. <laughs> that was so intense. That was, a that lot was more fun awesome. Than that. In the new major motion picture, Cruella, we dive into the origin story of one of the greatest villainesses in the Disney canon, Cruella de Vil. <laughs> Originally brought to life in Walt Disney's 1961 animated classic 101 Dalmatians, Cruella drove onto the scene as only she could, making her a legend in her own right. I know. While the filmmakers took some creative liberties, like setting the movie in 1970s London, there are still many similarities between these two films. Take a moment to rest. Today we explore and celebrate both movies that feature our favorite fashionista. You're gonna have to get invasive. The world she lives in and the characters she encounters. <laughs> what fun that is. Welcome to Cruella 101. Let's go. Let us begin with the frightening and fabulous titular character, Cruella de Vil. Fabulous. Of course, there is the obvious, the unique coloring of her hair. It's stunning. And her ruthless record of road rage. Whoa. Both versions of the character were inspired by movie star Tallulah Bankhead. My, my, my. Who makes a cameo appearance in the film here. <laughs> That's quite fabulous. Both Cruellas also bump shoulders among some of the same characters. Really? Including Anita. Anita, darling. That's right. Anita, darling. How are you? Anita appears in both films. It's been so long. In Cruella, we learn a little bit more about their backstory, dating all the way back to their childhood. I remember. You have a bit of an extreme side. <laughs> In 101 Dalmatians, Anita meets her future husband, Roger, when they were brought together by their dogs, Pongo and Pedita, in Regent's Park. Can we go here? Regent's Park. Perfect. A significant location in both films. She always comes here. Regent's Park. While that meeting between Anita and Roger may have been fate, we learn in the end credits of Cruella that it was also kindled by a mysterious gift. Hence the first time we meet Pongo and Pedita. So extraordinary. <laughs> we first meet Roger as the bumbling lawyer of the Baroness. This is my lawyer. Hi. We also learn he is an aspiring songwriter. Cruella de Vil. Does his apartment look familiar? You're going to have to be more specific. Look a bit closer. You just blew my mind. While we're on the subject of residences, let's take a look at Hell Hall. All right. The home of Cruella. Formerly Hellman Hall. That's a good point. In the animated film, Cruella lived in Hell Hall along with her faithful sidekicks, Jasper and Horace. Oh, good evening, Mum. These box truck driving henchmen sport similar silhouettes in both their live action and animated incarnations. You just be insane now. Does explain a lot. While they don't always get the credit from their boss... Imbeciles. I was rude. 
they are often brilliantly observant. You notice how some dog owners look a lot like their dogs. <laughs> and always trying to find the angle. <laughs> what is the angle? This concludes our lesson for today. I'm just getting started, darling. You did a great job spotting the similarities in both these films. Here, here. <laughs> Until next time, cheerio. Cheerio, darling. <laughs> Gorgeous and vicious. It's my favorite combination. This is me. I love the way she held herself, the way she spoke. So, let's begin. She thinks differently than people around her. You hope for that kind of challenge as an actor. To give up work, toe the domestic line, we are forced into these gingerbread shapes. God, it's all so depressing. The Baroness. She's not one of those people. If I cared about anyone or thing, I might have died like so many brilliant women with a drawer full of unseen genius. It's just this embarrassment of riches. We're dealing with a villain, so you have a little more freedom that way. You could possibly step into those shoes, the brilliant Emma Stone and the singular Emma Thompson. We have a battle of the two Emmas. I met with Disney back in 2015. They were just sort of playing around with the idea of an origin story of Cruella de Vil. And because it doesn't exist, there was a lot to sort of figure out and discover and see if it made sense to tell a story about her in that way. But the character is so much fun and so kind of intoxicating that I think they had an interest in finding, you know, what that story could be. It was a really long time coming, and it's pretty surreal that it finally did happen because after four years of like, is it gonna come together? Here we are. But Stella can't go to the ball. I know someone who can. I think people's idea of Cruella is that she is this mean, unhinged woman and she treats animals poorly and things like that. But I think what they maybe didn't expect was seeing the human side of her. Cruella is such a fascinating character because she's so arch and interesting. It wasn't what I was expecting, but it's way cooler than anything I was expecting. Emma Stone is a revelation. The original Cruella that Dodie Smith wrote the book about, the original character was based on Tallulah Bankhead. Emma just embraced that sort of sassy, quick-witted, like that on a dime. Do you understand? Why don't we create some buzz for this old rag that you continually fill with that old hag? <laughs> Watched a lot of Tallulah Bankhead and worked the movement coach on a lot of her mannerisms. She was definitely the biggest source of inspiration because she was what they based the original cartoon sound and movement on, and she's just so fabulous and does not care at all when anybody thinks of her, and that is Cruella in a nutshell. It makes perfect sense to take a sort of oddball, dark character like Cruella de Vil and give her a film. Change it up and do something new and evolved and interesting. There is an element to looking at a villain or what makes a villain and how people can be affected by the events that have happened in their lives or how they can crumble underneath the weight of something or rise up above it and not always take it to the best or most moralistic place. It's kind of talking about all of those things but in this kind of fun Disney, over the top, you know, crazy way. Check, check. I'm not quite sure about the death though. It won't be you. Mm, I'll get my coat. If it's going to be Emma Stone, then you're going to have to have an actress who's her equal in large measure. There's only one actress in our mind. That's me. And that was Emma Thompson. So it's one little step. One little step. Up and one little step. And I would get exactly onto that mark, my darling. Thank you. I heard about it, and my agent asked me to talk to Craig. Gillespie, and I'd seen I, Tonya, which I absolutely adored. And I love talking to Craig. And then my agent, I believe, threatened to have him hurt uh, if he didn't give me the job. When I first read it, that's what jumped out at me. It was, um, ooh, Bechdel test, big tick. Two leads are women who are working and who are adversaries in their work. And you don't see that very often, if at all. 
I love the whole premise of the story and the scenes with the two of them together. And that's something that was so exciting for me. Tony McNamara came up with a device that she has to go undercover. We could really have a lot more screen time with the two Emmas together. And that's really the most fun. I need 10 pieces that work by 3 a.m. The Baroness is the reason for Cruella, unfortunately. And that's sad, but it's a wonderful idea to see why someone becomes what they become. No one is interested in what you write, my dear. Just in how I look. When someone who is genuinely lovely and incredibly sweet and giving in real life plays a mean character, you can have so much more fun with it because it's so far removed from who they are. Sometimes like before takes will be like chatting or talking or whatever and then she turns into this character. But the moment it was done sort of giggling about it after. <laughs> I think Emma Thompson is, since I've been like knowingly wanting to be an actor, she's like so untouchable, really. Yes, that was yeah, that's good. I think you can maybe take a beat. So look at it first. Look at it, it's good. Very good, yes. I was in Scotland when I was preparing. I would meet Jenny Bevan, the costume designer, and Naomi Dunn, my hair and makeup designer. And we would do fittings and try shapes. And during that process, I slowly started to get a sniff of her. We sort of channeled the old screen divas, Joan Crawford, Elizabeth Taylor to Audrey Hepburn, to all the looks, insane hairdos. And costume designs are just extraordinary. It's a three-woman team to create the Baroness. Take a moment to revel in it. Well, that's enough. Baroness is a piece of work. She's incredible to act with because A, she's Emma Thompson, but B, the character is just so hilarious and so cruel. In a strange way, this is like a side of her that I hadn't seen before. I wouldn't say a surprise because she's such a brilliant actress, but to see another thing in her arsenal that I wasn't familiar with was just a delight to like see this character come to life and just grow and really be a scene still. How do I look? Fabulous. Well, I know that. Show me. It's about the making of Corella, but she really is the, the OG. I think you're something. Of course, for Cruella, the Baroness is a kind of dream. She's the figure behind this extraordinary house of fashion. So when she sees her, she's overwhelmed by her and dazzled by her, but it doesn't take long before she understands quite who she's dealing with. Here's to me. <laughs> It's quite hard for me to have any friction with Emma Stone because we're such good friends and she's my favorite young American. I just feel very lucky and we can create the friction because we're both very good actors. It's just our job. 1965 collection. Oh, no wonder I love it, it's mine. It was very fun to explore that stuff with Emma. And because she sort of stays at that crescendo throughout, it also was amazing for me to lightly study without it being two of the same person, for me to try to infuse little bits of her nature into the nature of Cruella. What drives her is not wanting ever to come second and not wanting ever to share the limelight with anybody else. Playing the two sides of Cruella, Estella and Cruella. It's been really interesting to kind of gauge the tone and how different they are. It's one thing to read it on the page, but it's another to really try to do it day in and day out. But I think it's kind of fantastic because it's the personification of those two sides of her hair. You know, there's kind of like the dark and the light. But one of the great things about Estella, the original Cruella, is written is that she's not like this pure, sweet, unattainably perfect creature. She's full of vim and vigor and she's feisty and smart and is a con artist. All right, we should put on some music or something. Lighten the mood. We did this like photo session day very early on and it was like a test footage shoot with the full Cruella garb in black and white. And she looks so cool and she holds herself with such confidence. Disney went on to show that test photo at the Disney Expo and suddenly that one image just ignited the entire internet where people got so excited for this movie. Cruella gets things done. Stella does not. 
there's always the question of like how cognizant is she of her actions? Is this a show or is this who she's become? Well, she's playing Corella, but then where does she become Corella? That was so intense! And she does an amazing job with playing with those facets until she finds her true self within there somewhere. She's got great evil character to get her teeth into. And she plays it with this combination of real charm and seductive wickedness. It's just delicious to watch. Did I? Uh... It really is a story of nature versus nurture, too. She was nurtured one way, and her nature may be different. I see it as her coming to terms with her nature, because as we know, Cruella de Vil is pretty villainous. And we understand at the end of this film that she's accepting it rather than fighting it. Anyway, mustache. Much to avenge, revenge and destroy. Morning, boys. Blaze. So let's begin. I made this in a pottery class. <laughs> Within the dynamic of all of our characters, it's like they, there is this trio with Corella, Jasper, and Horace. Morning. Estella is sort of thrust into this world of grifting with these two, living the life of someone who steals to get by. The parents aren't around and they're kind of thieves, basically. They're robbing stuff. They live in, like, an old wasteland bit of London. We were like a family. All right, let's go. Two minutes is stopping time. Paul Walker, Hauser, Joel Fry play Horace and Jasper. Their chemistry together is so marvelous. Hey! No. No what? I'm not letting you in that window so you can try and crack the safe. That's not my angle. There is no angle. Working with Paul has been really easy, and he's just brilliant at improvising as well. He's kind of fearless. When you have someone like that in a scene, you never really know what's going to happen. And he can say something that doesn't even make sense, but he's not scared to do that. Come on, Wink. Why are you looking at me like a stranger? Or is? To work on a Disney project has been a dream of mine, yeah. Um, take us back to the beginning. Yeah, the wind start over. That's why like I literally wanted to see how long it would take for you guys. <laughs> Sorry, guys. He's a method actor. You only moved to a town in Brixton, right? This guy's like really committed. Oh, top of the morning to you, Missy. Got some fashion items are most fashion. Thank you, kind and handsome delivery man. <laughs> the delightful thing with Paul, as an actor, he's so spontaneous, you never know what we're gonna get. And I think it keeps everybody on their toes and it keeps the scenes alive. I always found everything we were doing with him exciting. Oh, hey guys, what's going on? Is it still there? Kind of impressive. It was worth a try. <laughs> I don't know how he created that accent. <laughs> Could you give me a hand? Are you boys? So that accent, I grew up watching Bob Hoskins and Hook. He's Peter Pan, all right. He's just been gone from Neverland so long, he's forgotten everything. And I just remember that as a kid, it's ingrained in my memory. So when I went to our uh, dialect coach, I did that line, he goes, oh yeah, we're gonna be fine. You get it, you get it. Just do Hoskins. Well, that changes things, doesn't it? It does explain a lot. Back to why we did the follow-up line. Joel Fry, who plays Jasper, is one of those guys who doesn't have to do that much to be really funny. That was a bit much last night. <laughs> you think I fell into a cake? <laughs> the moment we started playing around, we kind of got a feel for what the chemistry could be. Hey, what a date or something? Jasper is really the heart of the film, and he's sort of the touchstone for Corella throughout the movie, where she's going too far astray and he'll call her on stuff. If I'm going to need to repeat myself a lot, this isn't going to work out. Why are you still talking like that? Griff's over. Joel, I actually think, is one of the most talented actors I've ever worked with. He's unbelievable. You can't kill her, Estella. Can't or shouldn't. No, look, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> You're cute when you are. I got to do a few scenes with Joel, you know, where we really get to look at each other and speak, and he's just so good. He's such a good actor. I know you're in pain. And I know she caused it, but killing her is not going to make that go away. I won't. He gave us such a beautiful performance there. He's like, he can carry the comedy, he can bounce off all the characters in the room and still keep it feeling grounded and heartfelt. It was beautiful to watch. Thanks for helping me. Well, I find it very difficult to say no to you sometimes. It's one of the things I love about you. Thanks. Jasper and Estella slash Cruella's relationship in the film, it's not romantic, but it's more intimate. 
I miss Estella. You know what I miss? The Jasper who had a sense of humour. That's tricky because it's like there's two characters in one. Is it so hard to support me? No, not Estella. That's easy. But Cruella, yeah, it's a nightmare, to be honest. When Cruella arrives, it's like, you know, it's a different... It's literally a different person, so everyone knows what Cruella's like as she just starts to boss it and do what Cruella does. Wreaking havoc at galas is my personal specialty. Well, I don't know about that. She's a boss. As Estella starts to change, the friendship starts to change, and Horace and Jasper aren't sure if they like where the friendship is headed. It's like they're more employees rather than friends. Oh, how lovely of her to thank us for our work. Yeah, real gracious, wasn't she? She has her fair share of mood swings because she's so filled with passion and life that that's sometimes something that Jasper and Horace have a harder time understanding. Want a ride? Yeah, I've had enough of being treated like a dog, thank you. No offense, Wink. You fancy a fry up? Yeah, I'll fancy a fry up without her. Yeah. OK. I kind of reset. Falling on hard times and creating a family, a family is what you make of it. And it doesn't always mean your blood. You see why they need each other long term. I'm sorry, I didn't realize there'd be company. John, this is my family. If you grow up with someone, you're kind of like family, aren't you? They're like family. They'll be staying a while. Oh, yeah. You're out of grumpies. I don't know what Cruella would be without Jasper and Horace. They're able to sort of balance out the parts of her that are relentless. You idiot, see, this was all a trick. It's never Estella, it's Cruella. It's Cruella de Vil. It's spelled like devil, but it's pronounced de Vil. Right, right, here we go. And, and. Estella. It's not Estella. I'm Cruella. I'd like to start my own label. I'm starting to remember that you have an extreme side. Well, then you remember what fun that is. <laughs> She is such a visual character. You have this wild black and white hair and this incredible makeup and these completely unique and fantastic costumes. My dog. I wanted to have an iconic cruella -y look, so it had real movement. And Emma Stone being Emma Stone, of course, she used it to her best advantage. Once you put those things on, you feel like Cruella de Vil, and it sort of just transports you into her world. Our costume designer, Jenny Bevan, is phenomenal, and she's created something really special. I read the script, and it was really fun and feisty. So we did all sorts of quite funky bits of clothing. The level of artistry that's gone into the creation of these costumes is enormous. This film was actually much more complex from the costume side, because not only were we having to create characters with costume, they were both fashion designers, so they both needed their whole fashion line that I knew the audience would be very critical about. It was a tall order, and she absolutely delivered. Good cut. Hello, thank you. Great, guys, check that. All right, check it again. Awesome. When we first meet Estella, she's a kid. So you're kind of seeing what her experience is like in school. <laughs> I always try and start at the beginning to see where someone comes from, because it's not about the clothes, it's about how they use them and how that then develops their story. Very good. One of the most fun things to explore with Estella slash Cruella is her creativity. She thinks outside of the box and thinks differently than a lot of the people around her and is very, very good at what she does, designing. It was a lovely basis then to build a character on that she finds these bits and puts them together eclectically. She does all sorts of things like graffiti all over the inside of her blazer, which she then wears the wrong way out and decorates it inappropriately and starts the whole punk thing. And need I remind you, we have a dress code. When she gets to the lair with the boys, she starts to borrow bits of their clothing. The costumes, like, if you're, like, wearing all this kind of stuff, you can't help but, like, start having a bit of a swag to your walk. You kind of float a bit more. So, uh, pretty glamorous, this fashion thing, then. Horace and Jasper, so amazingly cast. Obviously, by their sheer shapes and body language, are going to bring something. We tried to keep the colours, actually, of the animation, the aubergine, the green. Jasper almost always wears his hat. He's naturally a little more stylish. He just sort of that sharp, spiffy, checky thing. Horace, you needed boiler suits, and then they needed the disguises. For instance, you got him on the bus as a businessman with his umbrella open to take the offerings from Wink. A guy like me doesn't do a lot of wardrobe changes. Usually in film, people aren't that interested in that. 
I've done probably 16 to 20 different outfits in this film. From heist to heist, you'll get to see me kind of transform for those characters. I designed fabulous disguises. A stellar in the beginning is absolutely obsessed with fashion and that whole environment that bred this creativity in the punk movement. A lot of what she does, it's like making do with combinations of things and being inventive. You know, she's basically trained herself outside of the establishment. Okay. You get the sense that she would also have gone to vintage stores and Brick Lane when it was a rag market and, you know, all the places I used to go. Look around, Cinderella. If you can dream it, I can dress it. My character, Artie, owns a vintage shop called Second Time Around. He's very glam, you know, visually, but for him it's a lifestyle. He has the same philosophy as Cruella, being rebellious with how you look and how you present yourself to the world and not having to fit into the status quo. How does that look going on the streets? Mm. Some abuse and insults of course, but I like to say that normal is the cruelest insult of them all, and at least I never get that. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I didn't know much about the kind of late 70s fashion and the feeling of that sort of punk era. It was a whole new world for me. I've drop crotch pants and chain belts and creepers. I wore creepers a lot. Heavily platformed shoes that are very hard to run in, but very cool to look at. I think the amount of looks we had to do for Emma Stone is probably more again than I've ever done. I think she had 47 looks when we did the count up at the end. Cruella gets things done. And Emma Thompson as the Baroness had something like 31 or two. So, you know, we were into serious amounts. Jenny Bevan's costume designs are just extraordinary. Let's do it again. Every single one I go, oh, this is my favorite. Oh, no, no, this is my favorite. I just found. My signature piece. How do you like it? There are some costumes that were so beautiful I didn't want to take them off. But in the end, you have to take them off because you're wearing a corset underneath them, and the corsets are fantastically uncomfortable. Did you just lie to me? And the Baroness, I think I saw very clearly. Thank you all for coming. Very sculptural, Dior-influenced, slightly old-fashioned now for these post-60s times. I always saw it in those thick taffetas. You know, they almost hold their shape, real old duchess satins, thick, beautiful silks. And I just had a sense about the colours, that it was going to be brown and gold, as most of us choose a colour and stick to it. I've done it again. Let's go make history. The Baroness is someone who wouldn't be seen dead in a pair of sweatpants. The outward show is everything. There is nothing else. You know, it's this ruthless mask of high fashion. Baroness designs stunned. She really is a genius. She's a brilliant designer, but then this other person comes along who's better and modern and hip and chic and young and everything she can't bear. That's Cruella. It was just so much fun with Corella's character that she's fully ingrained in this punk sensibility. And you get to see how that sort of evolves. And then it's like, how is Corella gonna actually disrupt the Baroness's space? Whether it's this incredible black and white ball where I then set myself on fire and turn into a red dress. <laughs> I'd like to remind you that I'm doing all of this in heels. <laughs> or the ball at the end where everyone is dressed as Cruella and we're all wearing the same dress. It was spectacular. Arriving on a motorbike, which is the first photo bomb, we actually ended up keeping it quite simple because all these things were quite fast. She'd be there, blah, 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 and gone. So you needed to make maximum impact in a fairly short space of time. <laughs> Okay, the amazing dress that engulfs the car, this is photobomb number two. I was love juxtaposing a Chris military jacket with a flouncy skirt. We basically took that idea and exploded it. The jacket was decorated with all the stuff you would expect, eggletts, medals, you name it, but they're actual toys or watch straps. So it's like a toy cupboard on each shoulder. And then the skirt was all these like feathers in very deep red. I, I mean, I love that garbage dress. Ah. Garbage truck. Well, that did take quite a long time. I don't know if they ever say it in the script, but it was her 1967 spring collection. Putting it on was just like 
mind-blowing in a 40-foot train. Because it's supposed to be rubbish, we would use newspaper. It's like things you only ever imagine and you think you would actually put on your body and carry behind you on a garbage truck. That was one of my favorites. My favorite piece was the coat at the very end of the movie in the last scene is just beyond stunning. And I am hoping they'll let me take it home with me, but I doubt it. <laughs> Once you've stepped onto set with the costume, you can't help but really feel like you're dropped into the skin of a, of a character. And then you look around and the attention to detail in everybody has just been immaculate. I mean, the costumes are mad important in this one. I don't know how they've done it. It's a ridiculous amount of costumes. Here we go. Every single background artist looked like a lead character. It was like that. Ah. 20 dresses come in and the wardrobe people are, you know, you're watching and you're just like, someone had to sew and make and design all of that. You just gotta sit back and be amazed at what Jenny and her team have done. The scale of this movie is bigger than a lot of the films that I'm used to, and it's really incredible to look around at these masses and masses of people decked out to the nines. It's really a very important part of creating the world of Cruella. London, here we come. The scale of this movie is bigger than a lot of the films that I'm used to, and it's really incredible to look around at these like enormous sets, and the locations are just fantastic. The fun thing about Cruella is the sheer number of locations for such a large studio film. We've had 45 different locations, and I think we shot a location for nearly 40 days. It's had a vast scope for us, the amount of sets, the scale of sets. So we've got 96 official dress sets, that volume is, like, unheard of. I think it's one of the most exquisite production designs I've ever worked on. The level of artistry that's gone into the creation of this world is absolutely remarkable. One of the great joys of shooting in London, particularly a film that is set in London, is to take advantage of all the great settings that London has to offer. From the sort of back streets of London to huge mansions and the more aristocratic, fashionable places in London. All of those are essential to creating the world of Cruella and to tell the story. It's such an embarrassment of riches in London. I just loved having that texture of outside and the depth of it and really being able to see the London architecture. So I wanted to be outside as much as we could. We were looking within the London sort of region for the many locations. Obviously, we're very lucky in this country, and especially around London, to have some fabulous stately homes. One of those is Anglefield House, which we use for Hell Hall. In central London, we found some beautiful Georgian houses or period houses in Westminster for our House of Baroness exterior. We have filmed quite a lot in Greenwich at the Naval College. It's these amazing, beautiful grand buildings. It's an incredibly versatile site. We've used it for several red carpets. So we've used it for some parks. Quite quintessentially London, but again, a little bit different, for example, to where we did our vintage store, which was in Notting Hill, which is a little bit edgier, which is why we put that scene there, because she's finding the punk fruits that we then later explore. We had a really short window oh. to dress that street. Day and a half. Yeah, a day and a half to, to do Portobello Road. I mean, there were people everywhere. We were changing awnings and signage and turning cafes into hardware stores. Every yeah. single thing got changed. It was really exciting to me being able to work in those spaces in the actual locations that we're setting the film. In fact, I think the first shot we did was Horace and Jasper and Estella running out of Liberties and jumping on a bus going down the street with 1970s traffic and a camera chasing them. It was a great way to sort of kick off the show. Liberties, such a beautiful old building, and they've kept it so wonderfully. From a personal point of view, it's one of my favorite places. And the Baroness is so rude about it. God, it's all so depressing. I think one of the most exciting moments was we filmed, obviously, outside Liberties, but then the production recreated the interior at the studio, and it was absolutely gobsmacking. It was spectacular the most iconic department store in London, and here we are, not in it, yet in it. 
There was no way we could go into Liberty's and strip out their stock, and you know, it just wasn't going to happen. So we had it 3D scanned, and then we had the whole thing made. So you're absolutely recognisably in Liberty, and we've copied it very faithfully. We made all the scarves, we made the bags, we made all the tables, the jewellery cases, all to fit exactly the space. This is our pack and wrap counter. All the working drawers and they put period staplers in and then you've got all the Liberties bags which our graphics department have made. Liberties boxes, <laughs> little hooks with all the swing tags on. I don't even know how much you're going to see on camera which is devastating because it's so much detail. It was just really special. <laughs> I've actually spent quite a lot of time on the sets just because I wanted to look at all the props, literally every detail. And my warehouse, I just wanted to live in it. It was so beautiful. I mean, on everything, the House of Baroness is written on my notepaper, on my cards. Things that the audience will never see are there for us as actors. In that set, we pretty much made everything. The couture tables where they cut, the designer's tables that were made, the cases that their pencils came in, every single thing was bespoke to that warehouse. It's stunning. We have enormous sets on this production. These absolutely gorgeous settings. The lair is actually one of my favorite sets that she did. The walls and the layers of wallpaper and just the flow of the whole space. We're on! There's a lot of the film set in that space and I didn't want it to become tonally too repetitive. So we just had lots of detail and texture off in the corners. Yeah, just kind of keep it interesting and then set it on fire. Yeah. The thing I would say actually across the film that I'm so thrilled with is just the level of craftsmanship because in many ways, the same craftsmanship that you see in the lair, whether it's how they've done peeling paint, is as important to me as the marble finishes in Hellman Hall. And yeah, we did have 5,000 pieces of individually hand-painted marble, so every single piece in there is unique. I think overwhelmingly, it's a fantastic visual experience. The attention to detail on every level is a remarkable achievement in every department. I've never seen anything like it. When you walked into the Baroness's warehouse, or the lair, or the interior of Home and Hall, it's mind-blowing. And it just transports you into this world of Cruella. I think we're really doing something very fun, filled with great dogs that are very expressive in a way that is just... I love watching. I really do like working with animals and children, so I'm unusual like that, but I've really enjoyed working with them. Oh, hello. Oh, I'll see you at the bar. But, um, I'm going to pop it up now, OK? Bye. They're very happy creatures. Good girl! The dogs were absolutely amazing, and we would always try and have them do everything. But there are literally times in the film where I'm sitting there now and I'm like, hang on, is this CG or is this the real dog? I'm trying to remember. Because they did such an incredible job. The one nice thing about working with dogs is dogs kind of want to do what you want them to do. The pat on the head means just as much as the treat after a while, if not more. So it's really refreshing to work with dogs that you create such a relationship with. It's a partnership. We started about four months before we started filming. And we trained specifically for the actions that were called for in the script. Pull it! Pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it! Oh, you kidding me? You animals! There's basic behaviors where we do a sit, stay, lay down on your feet, stand, marks. And we also work with distractions such as flags, cameras, lights, booms. All of that is in our pre prep. <laughs> Some of my favorite sequences involve the Dalmatians because they're a nod to the original film and one gets to see the origins of how did Dalmatians sort of come into the world of Cruella? Yes, aren't they gorgeous? 
We are very energetic dogs. Dalmatians, I believe, were carriage dogs. They were sort of bred back in the day to stay with the carriage and keep the horses safe. So they have a lot of energy, but they're also incredibly smart. There you go, good girl, there it is. That's a good girl. So we used six different Dalmatians to play the three dogs that really are almost kind of one character in the movie. Thank you all for coming. How wonderful. Any time I had to work with the three dogs and I had to go on the move with them was very funny because often they would just drag me so far and I'd be standing there, you know, very baronessy and calm and suddenly I'd be just jerked right through the hall running. Wait for me. <laughs> Uh-oh. That's not going to be easy, you guys. Wink is Horace and Jasper's dog. You notice how some dog owners look a lot like their dogs? No, I've never noticed that. What about now? Wink helps them in their criminal enterprises by helping them pick pockets and escape with wallets. We have actually five chihuahuas that play Wink. And a couple of them were rescues. Bluebell and Narla were the two that I mainly used. Bluebell is like a princess, and she really wants to do things, but she doesn't know where her feet are sometimes. Narla is like a big dog personality in a little dog body and creates havoc and plays with the toys. So it's really great to have two different personalities like that as a team. Oh, that's a hybrid. People are gonna fall in love with the little eye patch on Wink. How can you not love this face? I'm pretty sure kids are going to dress up as Wink for Halloween and people will be like, are you a pirate? And they're like, no, I'm the dog from Cruella. Come on, Wink. Buddy is a little puppy that Cruella finds in a dumpster early in the film. She loves the dog, which is an interesting twist on their character. Buddy is played by a little dog named Bobby, who has a great story. He is a little mutt that was found on the streets of Cyprus and was rescued. And they called Jules, who is one of our trainers, and she went down and adopted him. And about three days later, he got cast in this movie. <laughs> So from the streets to Hollywood star. He's just enjoyed every minute, completely come out of his shell, and just, and he drags me to the set. He's just absolutely loving it. Hello, 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 hello. He's like, what are you trying to do to me? Bobby is a true superstar. It's like meeting Lassie. I don't even know what to do. You're such a good boy. You're such a good boy. The movie opening credits should be and introducing Bobby as Buddy because I, I, I can't live without him. He's like one of the best dogs I've ever met. Emma has been incredible. She'll always take treats and look after him. She'll you know keep, give him confidence during the scenes. Oh, hey, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> She's fooling for Bobby, yeah. Immediate props to dog trainers. It's a lot of work. It can be crazy sometimes. It's about making it positive for the dog, making sure that he's having fun. The hardest thing about this film is all the dogs working together in the scene. It's just one dog and there's one trainer kind of directing that dog. It's fairly manageable. When there's three Dalmatians and Buddy and Wink and everybody's working and they're all doing different things, that's where it gets really challenging. And a lot of times the first two or three takes are their best and then it starts going downhill from there.